For five months they had been talking of going to take a luncheon in one of the country suburbs of Paris on Madame Dufour's birthday, and as they were looking forward very impatiently to the outing, they rose very early that morning. Monsieur Dufour had borrowed the milkman's wagon and drove himself. It was a very tidy two-wheel conveyance, with a cover supported by four iron rods, with curtains that had been drawn up except the one at the back, which floated out like a sail. Madame de Four, resplendent in a wonderful cherry-coloured silk dress, sat by the side of her husband. The old grandmother and a girl sat beside them on two chairs, and a boy with yellow hair was lying at the bottom of the wagon, with nothing to be seen except his head. When they reached the bridge of Neuilly, Monsieur de Four said, here we are in the country at last. And at that signal his wife grew sentimental about the beauties of nature. When they got to the crossroads at Courbevoie, they were seized with admiration for the distant landscape. On the right was Argenteuil with its bell tower, and above it rose the hills of saint Noir and the mill of Orgemont while on the left the aqueduct of Marley stood out against the clear morning sky, and in the distance they could see the terrace of Saint-Germain, and opposite them, at the end of a low chain of hills, the new fort of Cormiel. Quite in the distance, a very long way off, beyond the plains and village, one could see the sombre green of the forests. The sun was beginning to burn their faces, the dust got into their eyes, and on either side of the road there stretched an interminable tract of bare ugly country with an unpleasant odour. One might have thought that it had been ravaged by pestilence, which had even attacked the buildings, for skeletons of dilapidated and deserted houses, or small cottages, which were left in an unfinished state because the contractors had not been paid, reared their four roofless walls on each side. Here and there tall factory chimneys rose up from the barren soil, the only vegetation on that putrid land, where the spring breezes wafted an odour of petroleum and slate, blended with another odour that was even less agreeable. At last, however, they crossed the Seine a second time, and the bridge was a delight. The river sparkled in the sun, and they had a feeling of quiet enjoyment, felt refreshed as they drank in the pure air that was not impregnated by the black smoke of factories, nor by the miasma from the deposits of night soil. A man whom they had met told them that the name of the place was Bezon. Monsieur de Four pulled up, and read the attractive announcement outside an eating house. Restaurant Poulon, Matelots and Fresh Fish, Private Rooms, Arbors and Swings. Well, Madame de Four, will this suit you? Will you make up your mind at last? She read the announcement in her turn, and then looked at the house for some time. It was a white country inn, built by the roadside, and through the open door she could see the bright zinc of the counter, at which sat two workmen in their Sunday clothes. At last she made up her mind and said, Yes, this will do, and besides, there is a view. They drove into a large field behind the inn, separated from the river by the towing path, and dismounted. The husband sprang out first, and then held out his arms to his wife. And as the step was too high, Madame Dufour, in order to reach him, had to show the lower part of her limbs, whose former slenderness had disappeared in fat. And Monsieur Dufour, who was already getting excited by the country air, pinched her calf, and then, taking her in his arms, he set her on the ground, as if she had been an enormous bundle. She shook the dust out of her silk dress, and then looked round to see in what sort of place she was. She was a stout woman of about thirty-six, full-blown and delightful to look at. 
she could hardly breathe, as her corsets were laced too tightly, and their pressure forced her superabundant bosom up to her double chin. Next the girl placed her hand on her father's shoulder, and jumped down lightly. The boy with yellow hair had got down by stepping on the wheel, and he helped Monsieur de Four to lift his grandmother out. Then they unharnessed the horse, which they had tied to a tree, and the carriage fell back, with both shafts in the air. The men took off their coats and washed their hands in a pail of water, and then went and joined the ladies, who had already taken possession of the swings. Mademoiselle de Four was trying to swing herself standing up, but she could not succeed in getting a start. She was a pretty girl of about eighteen, one of those women who suddenly excite your desire when you meet them in the street, and who leave you with a vague feeling of uneasiness and of excited senses. She was tall, had a small waist and large hips, with a dark skin, very large eyes, and very black hair. Her dress clearly marked the outlines of her firm, full figure, which she accentuated by the motion of her hips as she tried to swing herself higher. Her arms were stretched upward to hold the rope, so that her bosom rose at every movement she made. Her hat, which a gust of wind had blown off, was hanging behind her, and as the swing gradually rose higher and higher, she showed her delicate limbs up to the knees each time, and the breeze from her flying skirts, which was more heady than the fumes of wine, blew into the faces of the two men, who were looking at her and smiling. Sitting in the other swing, Madame Dufour kept saying in a monotonous voice, Cyprian, come and swing me, do come and swing me, Cyprian. At last he went, and turning up his shirt sleeves, as if undertaking a hard piece of work, with much difficulty, he set his wife in motion. She clutched the two ropes and held her legs out straight, so as not to touch the ground. She enjoyed feeling dizzy at the motion of the swing, and her whole figure shook like a jelly on a dish. But as she went higher and higher, she became too giddy and was frightened. Each time the swing came down, she uttered a piercing scream, which made all the little urchins in the neighbourhood come round. And down below, beneath the garden hedge, she vaguely saw a row of mischievous heads making various grimaces as they laughed. When a servant girl came out, they ordered luncheon. Some fried fish, a rabbit sauté, salad and dessert, Madame de Force said, with an important air. Bring two quarts of beer and a bottle of claret, her husband said. We will have lunch on the grass, the girl added. The grandmother, who had an affection for cats, had been running after one that belonged to the house, trying to coax it to come to her for the last ten minutes. The animal, who was no doubt secretly flattered by her attentions, kept close to the good woman, but just out of reach of her hand and quietly walked round the trees, against which she rubbed herself, with her tail up, purring with pleasure. Hello! suddenly exclaimed the young man with yellow hair, who was wandering about. Here are two swell boats! They all went to look at them, and saw two beautiful canoes in a wooden shed. They were beautifully finished, as if they had been ornamental furniture, they hung side by side like two tall slender girls in their narrow shining length and made one wish to float in them on warm summer mornings and evenings along the flower-covered banks of the river where the trees dip their branches into the water where the rushes are continually rustling in the breeze and where the swift kingfishers dart about like flashes of blue lightning the whole family looked at them with great respect Oh, they are indeed swell boats, Monsieur de Four repeated gravely, as he examined them like a connoisseur. He'd been in the habit of rowing in his younger days, he said, and when he had spat in his hands, and he went through the action of pulling the oars, 
He did not care a fig for anybody. He had beaten more than one Englishman formerly, the Jeanville Regatta. He grew quite excited at last, and offered to make a bet that, in a boat like that, he could row six leagues an hour without exerting himself. Luncheon is ready, the waitress said, appearing at the entrance to the boathouse, and they all hurried off. But two young men had taken the very seats that Madame de Four had selected, and were eating their luncheon. No doubt they were the owners of the skulls, for they were in boating costume. They were stretched out, almost lying on the chairs. They were sun-browned, and their thin cotton jerseys, with short sleeves, showed their bare arms, which were as strong as blacksmiths. They were two strong athletic fellows, who showed in all their movements that elasticity and grace of limb, which can only be acquired by exercise, and which is so different to the deformity with which monotonous heavy work stamps the mechanic. They exchanged a rapid smile when they saw the mother, and then a glance on seeing the daughter. Let us give up our place, one of them said. It'll make us acquainted with them. The other got up immediately, and holding his black and red boating cap in his hand, he politely offered the ladies the only shady place in the garden. With many excuses they accepted, and that it might be more rural, they sat on the grass, without either tables or chairs. The two young men took their plates, knives, forks, etc., to a table a little way off, began to eat again, and the bare arms, which they showed continually, rather embarrassed the girl. She even pretended to turn her head aside and not to see them, while Madame de Four, who was rather bolder, tempted by feminine curiosity, looked at them every moment, and, no doubt, compared them with the secret and sightliness of her husband. She had squatted herself on the ground, with her legs tucked under her, after the manner of tailors, and she kept moving about restlessly, saying that ants were crawling about her somewhere. Monsieur de Four, annoyed at the presence of the polite strangers, was trying to find a comfortable position, which he did not, however, succeed in doing. And the young man with yellow hair was eating silently as an ogre. "'It is lovely weather, monsieur,' the stout lady said to one of the boating men. She wished to be friendly because they had given up their place. "'It is indeed, madam,' he replied. "'Do you often go into the country?' "'Oh, only once or twice a year to get a little fresh air. "'And you, monsieur?' I come and sleep here every night. Oh, that must be very nice. Certainly it is, madam. And he gave them such a practical account of his daily life that it awakened afresh in the hearts of these shopkeepers who were deprived of the meadows and who longed for country walks to that foolish love of nature which they all feel so strongly the whole year round behind the counter in their shop. The girl raised her eyes and looked at the oarsman with emotion. The Monsieur de Four spoke for the first time. "'It is indeed a happy life,' he said. And then he added, "'A little more rabbit, my dear.' "'No, thank you,' she replied, and turning to the young men again, and pointing to their arms, asked, "'Do you ever feel cold like that?' They both began to laugh and they astonished the family with an account of the enormous fatigue they could endure, of their bathing while in a state of tremendous perspiration, of their rowing in the fog at night, and they struck their chest violently to show how hollow they sounded. "'Ah, um, you look very strong,' said the husband, who did not talk any more of the time when he used to beat the English. The girl was looking at them sideways now, and the young fellow with yellow hair, who had swallowed some wine the wrong way, was coughing violently, and bespattering Madame de Fiore's cherry-coloured silk dress. She got angry, and sent for some water to wash the spots. Meanwhile, it had grown unbearably hot, 
the sparkling river looked like a blaze of fire, and the fumes of wine were getting into their heads. Monsieur Dufour, who had a violent hiccup, had unbuttoned his waistcoat and the top button of his trousers, while his wife, who felt choking, was gradually unfastening her dress. The apprentice was shaking his yellow wig in a happy frame of mind, and kept helping himself to wine, and the old grandmother, feeling the effects of the wine, was very stiff and dignified. As for the girl, one noticed only a peculiar brightness in her eyes, while the brown cheeks became more rosy. The coffee finished, they suggested singing, and each of them sang or repeated a couplet, while the others applauded frantically. Then they got up with some difficulty, and while the two women, who were rather dizzy, were trying to get a breath of air, the two men, who were altogether drunk, were attempting <coughs> gymnastics. Heavy, limp, with scarlet faces, they hung awkwardly to the iron rings, without being able to raise themselves. Meanwhile, the two boating men had got their boats into the water, and they came back and politely asked the ladies whether they would like a row. Would you like one, Monsieur Dufour? his wife exclaimed. Please come. He merely gave her a drunken nod, without understanding what she said. Then one of the rowers came up with two fishing rods in his hands, and the hope of catching a gudgeon, that great vision of the Parisian shopkeeper, made Dufour's dull eyes gleam, and he politely allowed them to do whatever they liked, while he sat in the shade under the bridge, with his feet dangling over the river, by the side of the young man with yellow hair, who was sleeping soundly. One of the boating men made a martyr of himself, and took the mother. Let us go to the little wood on the Ile aux Anglais, he called out as he rowed off. The other boat went more slowly, for the rower was looking at his companion so intently that he thought of nothing else, and his emotion seemed to paralyse his strength, while the girl, who was sitting in the bow, gave herself up to the enjoyment of being on the water. She felt a disinclination to think, a lassitude in her limbs, and a total enervation, as if she were intoxicated and her face was flushed, and her breathing quickened. The effects of the wine, which were increased by the extreme heat, made all the trees on the bank seem to bow as she passed. A vague wish for enjoyment, and a fermentation in her blood, seemed to pervade her whole body, which was excited by the heat of the day. And she was also disturbed at this tete-a-tete -tete on the water, in a place which seemed depopulated by the heat, with this young man, who thought her pretty, whose ardent looks seemed to caress her skin, and were as penetrating and pervading as the sun's rays. Their inability to speak increased their emotion, and they looked about them. At last, however, he made an effort and asked her her name. Henriette, she said. Why, my name is Henry, he replied. The sound of their voices had calmed them and they looked at the banks. The other boat had passed them and seemed to be waiting for them. And the rower called out, We will meet you in the wood. We are going as far as Robinson's because Madame Dufour is thirsty. Then he bent over his oars again and rowed off so quickly that he was soon out of sight. Meanwhile, a continual roar, which they had heard for some time, came nearer and the river itself seemed to shiver as if the dull noise were rising from its depths. What is that noise? she asked. It was the noise of the weir, which cut the river in two at the island. And he was explaining it to her, when, above the noise of the waterfall, they heard the song of a bird, which seemed a long way off. Listen, he said, the nightingales are singing during the day, so the female birds must be sitting. A nightingale. She had never heard one before, and the idea of listening to one roused visions of poetic tenderness in her heart. A nightingale, that is to say, 
the invisible witness of her love trysts, which Juliet invoked on her balcony, that celestial music which it attuned to human kisses, that internal inspire of all those languorous romances, which open an ideal sky to all the poor little tender hearts of sensitive girls. She was going to hear a nightingale. We must not make a noise, her companion said, and then we can go into the wood and sit down close beside it. The boat seemed to glide. They saw the trees on the island, the banks of which were so low they could look into the depths of the thickets. They stopped. He made the boat fast. Henriette took hold of Henry's arm and they went beneath the trees. Stoop, he said, and so she stooped down and they went into an inextricable thicket of creepers, leaves and reed grass, which formed an undiscoverable retreat and which the young man laughingly called his private room. Just above their heads, perched in one of the trees which hid them, the bird was still singing. He uttered trills and roulades and then loud vibrating notes which filled the air and seemed to lose themselves on the horizon across the level country through that burning silence which weighed upon the whole landscape. They did not speak for fear of frightening it away. They were sitting close together and, slowly, Henry's arm stole round the girl's waist and squeezed it gently. She took that daring hand without any anger and kept removing it whenever he put it around her, without, however, feeling at all embarrassed by this caress, just as if it had been something quite natural, which she was resisting just as naturally. She was listening to the bird in ecstasy. She felt an infinite longing for happiness, for some sudden demonstration of tenderness, for the revelation of superhuman poetry. And she felt such a softening at her heart and relaxation of her nerves that she began to cry, not knowing why. The young man was now straining her close to him, yet she did not remove his arm. She did not think of it. Suddenly the nightingale stopped, and a voice called out in the distance. Henriette? Do not reply, he said in a low voice. You will drive the bird away. But she had no idea of doing so, and they remained in the same position for some time. Madame Dufour had sat down somewhere or other, for from time to time they heard the stout lady break out into little bursts of laughter. The girl was still crying. She was filled with strange sensations. Henry's head was on her shoulder. And suddenly he kissed her on the lips. <gasps> she was surprised and angry, and, to avoid him, she stood up. They were both very pale when they left their grassy retreat. The blue sky appeared to them clouded, and the ardent sun darkened, and they felt the solitude and the silence. They walked rapidly, side by side, without speaking or touching each other, for they seemed to have become irreconcilable enemies, as if disgust and hatred had arisen between them. And from time to time Henriette called out, Mama! By and by they heard a noise behind a bush, and the stout lady appeared, looking rather confused, and her companion's face was wrinkled with smiles which he could not check. <coughs> Madame Dufour took his arm and they returned to the boats and Henry, who was ahead, walked in silence beside the young girl. At last they got back to Bezon. Monsieur Dufour, who was now sober, was waiting for them very impatiently while the young man with the yellow hair was having a mouthful of something to eat before leaving the inn. The carriage was waiting in the yard, and the grandmother, who had already got in, was very frightened at the thought of being overtaken by night before they reached Paris, as the outskirts were not safe. They all shook hands, and the Dufour family drove off. 
Goodbye, until we meet again, the oarsmen cried. And the answer they got was a sigh and a tear. Two months later, as Henry was going along the Rue de Martyr, he saw Dufour, ironmonger, over a door. And so he went in, and saw the stout lady sitting at the counter. They recognized each other immediately, and after an interchange of polite greetings, he asked after them all. And how is Mademoiselle Henry yet? he inquired specially. Very well, thank you. She is married. Ah. He felt a certain emotion, but said, uh, who, Whom did she marry? That young man who accompanied us, you know. He has joined us in business. I remember him perfectly. He was going out, feeling very unhappy, though scarcely knowing why, when Madame called him back. And how is your friend? she asked rather shyly. He is very well, thank you. Please give him my compliments and beg him to come and call when he's in the neighbourhood. Then she added, Tell him it will give me great pleasure. I will be sure to do so. Adieu. Do not say that. Come again very soon. The next year, one very hot Sunday, all the details of that adventure, which Henry had never forgotten, suddenly came back to him so clearly that he returned alone to their room in the wood, and was overwhelmed with astonishment when he went in. She was sitting on the grass, looking very sad, while by her side, still in his shirt sleeves, the young man with yellow hair was sleeping soundly like some animal. She grew so pale when she saw Henry that at first he thought she was going to faint. Then, however, they began to talk quite naturally. But when he told her that he was very fond of that spot and went there frequently on Sundays to indulge in memories, she looked into his eyes for a long time. I too think of it, she replied. Come, my dear, her husband said with a yawn. I think it's time for us to be going. <laughs>